Good afternoon, and thank you for joining my talk. I'm talking to you from the south of Germany, where I work at a company called SIGAT, which was founded in 2009. We offer genetic diagnostics to medical professionals, but also sequencing services to research and pharma customers. We have five Novaseeks, more than 300 gifted people, and we're fully accredited for both parts of business. My background is bioinformatics. I've been working with SIGAT for more than 10 years now, and my responsibilities as Director of Development and Head of Bioinformatics comprise also the validation of new methods and translation into clinical products. Let's look at one of those products that we work on. In tumor diagnostics, as you probably know, if you have a patient's blood, you can look for tumor syndromes that are inherited. And if you have tumor material, you can look at actionable variants from DNA and RNA levels. If you have both materials, you can do a full somatic analysis, determining not only tumor variants, but also biomarkers as mutational burden, and even you can predict neoepitopes for novel vaccination approaches. Some years ago, another type of sample was added to this list, and this is called liquid biopsies. The idea is that free-floating tumor DNA is extracted from a patient's bloodstream. This allows us to monitor disease recurrence, but also to analyze inaccessible tumors and look at tumor heterogeneity in patients with multiple metastases. So when this new method came out, we decided to do a study. And we selected 100 patients with different tumor entities for which we did tumor sequencing and blood sequencing to determine their driver variants. Then we selected assays for digital droplet PCR, a method to very sensitively find mutations. And we collected liquid biopsy samples from these patients over time. We collected an average of 10 samples per patient and performed DDPCR to look at these samples and at disease recurrence. What we saw in this data is already the two challenges that are associated with liquid biopsies. One is you do not have a lot of cell-free DNA. So in our cohort, it was about 24 nanograms on, in a median. And then most of this cell-free DNA is not even tumor-derived, less than 1% in our cohort, even though these were tumor patients. So these two challenges make it hard to work with the material. But also, digital droplet PCR only allows us to look at one variant at a time. So we wanted to work with a next-generation sequencing approach to look at multiple variants de novo. And we decided to develop an approach based on molecular barcoding, but we wanted to validate this approach. And how can we validate such an assay? First, what, would we want, what do we want to know? We want to look at the limit of detection. That means what is the lowest content of the tumor in the cell-free DNA or the lowest allele frequency that we can still detect? What's the minimal input amount that we need to do this detection? How sensitive, specific, and precise is our measure, method for these minimal inputs? And how reproducible is it? Before we go into details here, let's look at the words sensitivity, specificity, and precision, because these are very important. Consider an assay that looks for six different variants in a patient. Now we have a patient here with two variants present. If our test detects one of those two variants, we say the sensitivity is 0.5. If it also falsely detects two variants that are not in the patient, we say the specificity is 0.5. But what matters in the end is what do we report to the patient? And in this case, two of three variants that we report are wrong. So our precision is 0.33. And this is a very hard to determine factor for these tests and something to keep in mind. So when you see very high specificity figures for tests, always consider that this, this does not have to mean that the final report is very precise. With this background, let's look at what we need to do such a val validation. We need enough material of a standardized uh, sample to do replicates and check different input amounts. The sample has to have enough variance so we can get sufficiently good sensitivity estimates. The variants need to be at different allele frequencies so we can determine our limit of detection. We need information about variants that are not present in the sample to find out about specificity. And finally, we want the sample material to be as close to real world samples as possible. When we were working with our cohort and started our validation, such a sample did not exist. So we thought perhaps we can do this with our cohort samples. And this offers us two options. We could use single samples. If we only use samples that have enough material for both DDPCR and NGS, we have still quite a number of variants at different allele frequencies. And the first thing we can look at is at what allele frequencies are variant detected in the both methods and how does that correlate? And as you see here, it correlates quite nicely. However, this population of variants has a few problems. For example, there is a number of variants with higher allele frequencies that do not help us in determining sensitivity at a low limit of detection. 
There are also variants that didn't work in digital droplet PCR. So the number of variants we can look at is not very large. Also, we don't have enough material to do any replicates and we have no information about negative variants, so we cannot determine specificity. Another option is to use a mixture of samples. So we would pick samples with enough material and different variants that we can mix them and get allele frequencies at defined levels. That allows us to have more material and even do a few replicates. If you mix such a standard, it always makes sense to check if the mixture was correct. And as you can see here, our plant allele frequencies mostly panned out. There is a bit of quantification or mixing error. And again, DDPCR failed in some samples, but overall this was looking good. However, we only have nine variants we can look at. We have no known negatives, cannot determine specificity, and we only have very few replicates we can do. So coming back to the requirements we had for our standard, you can see that we don't have enough material in the cohort samples, we don't have enough variants in either sample, and we cannot say anything about specificity. So this is where we were. And then TWIST came out with a new reference standard. It's based on donor-derived CFDNA, so it's like a real-world sample. It has a very large number of variants, and it's available at different allelic frequencies. Some of the variants in the standard are also validated by DDPCR. Using this standard, we decided to revisit our validation. We have a small panel of 21 kilobases that we sequenced, and it covers 64 variants, of which most are SNPs. We sequenced triplicates from the 0% and 0.25% standard using duplex molecular barcoding to arrive at a final coverage of about 1500 X on target. Let's look at some data. Single nucleotide variants, you can see that in the 0% standard, there are a few false positives, but they are very low allele frequencies. And you can see that there's quite some noise in the 0.25% standard. This is to be expected at these low allele frequencies with this low coverage that we're using. Looking at indel variants, you can see that these long indels have no false positives. This makes sense because such an error does not appear at random. You can also see that one of our three replicates in the 0.25% standard has a lot of false negatives. So this is an issue of reproducibility, which we'll have to investigate further. Another interesting thing about indels is that if you look at the average allele frequency observed for indels and SNPs, you can see that in all the replicates we did, the SNPs are at the, at the frequency that we would expect them to be, while the indels are lower. So we had a theory that this might be due to reference bias because we are using probe hybridization to enrich the targets of interest, and these probes would bind less efficiently to DNA molecules containing insertions and deletions. And this would mean that longer insertions and deletions would also have a lower allele frequency. And in fact, this is the case. So here we see data from the 0.5% standard, where you see the longer the indel is, the less strong we can see it in the data. This is something to keep in mind for sensitivity if your assay is working with indels as well. There's another class of indels, homopolymer insertions and deletions, and this is interesting to look at because these show consistent false positives in the 0% standard, and we even see them at more than 0.1% allele frequency. You might wonder why is this possible, because we're using duplex molecular barcoding such an error can only be observed if it happens in the first PCR cycle on both strands of the target molecule. If you think about it, the longer the mononucleotide sequence is, the more likely it is that at one of those positions, a polymerase slips and inserts or deletes one of those positions. And this means that the likelihood of such an error is larger than for single nucleotide variants. And as you can see in our data, it's basically one or two reads of the 1500 coverage that contributes to these errors. Now look at some standard requirements again. With the twist reference, we finally have enough material to do as many replicates and different input amounts that, as we want. We can also do different lab protocols. We have enough variants for good sensitivity estimates. The larger your panel, the better it is. We have variants at different allele frequencies, so we can do determination of limit of detection. We know about variants not present because we have a 0% standard, and the material is very similar to real-world samples. I don't want to end this talk without showing you some validation results. So again, using the data that I showed you earlier, 0.25% standard for sensitivity, 0% standard for specificity, and calling variance from 0.1%, you can see that sensitivity and uh, specificity, both for indels and SNPs, is actually quite nice. And the interesting thing now is, I told you about the cohort-based validation. And of course, that's what we did earlier. And if we compare the data from these three approaches, we can see that the sensitivity estimate 
is very similar for all of them, but the confidence interval is of course a lot smaller when you have more variance. And the reference standard used here is the only one that gives us a specificity estimate. With this data, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions. And I'm also very happy to thank my collaborators in the CGAT lab, in the CGAT bioinformatics team, and the TWIST R&D team. Thank you.